Welcome to China Manufacturing Decoded from Sofeast, the podcast where we take you through some of the major topics facing importers and manufacturers in China today. Hi, listener. This is episode thirty-nine. Adrian from Sofeast here, and today I'm joined by another special guest, Richard Barnett, who is the CMO of Supply Frame. Now he's over there in Texas, and today we're discussing electronics supply chains, and specifically how to reduce risks and make them a lot more resilient. Given everything that's going on in this past year or so, and continues to be going on with the pandemic, reducing risks, as we said before, is more important than ever. So, getting Richard's thoughts on this, given that he's got decades of experience in Asia, working in the electronics field, means that we're going to get some really great insight into how to manage those risks. So, let's hear what Richard had to say. Hi, Richard. Thanks for joining me today. It's so great to have you here. Really excited to hear about your experience and everything that you're doing. Thank you so much, Adrian. It's, it's an honor uh, and a privilege to uh, to join you and your audience today and and talk about some pretty uh, top of mind uh, you know topics for discussion around you know um, how to uh, manage innovation and you know post COVID uh, you know what do we expect and what are we seeing across the global electronics value chain. Tons of great questions here to uh, drive, dive into. Yeah, that, and that's sort of intro and what we're going to be going into. So thanks for that. Certainly, with the framework of post-COVID as well, this is something that's always going to be really important for the listener. So before we kick off and get into some questions and really tap into your experience, could you just briefly introduce yourself and your history? You bet. So、um, I am currently Chief Marketing Officer at Supply Frame. And I joined Supply Frame in February of last year, which is、uh, a very interesting timing. We can get into later、mm. about right before kind of the work from home and and kind of the COVID、uh, pandemic really started becoming more clear.、Um, but I started my career、uh, broadly in the、uh, software industry、um, back in '95, and you know did some time、um, you know early on working for you know innovative companies that were solving sort of you know. Very high value、uh, challenges in, you know, say global manufacturing, high tech,、uh, using you know advanced technology. So I started working with a company called Trilogy Software that focused on complex product configuration problems for telecom and you know high end computing,、uh, you know servers, etc. And then went to I2 Technologies back in、um, in '97, which became a leader in the supply chain management software. Space and、uh, spent most of my time、uh, starting up I2 Japan and living in Tokyo for three years,、wow. supporting all of our uh, growth uh, in Asia Pacific as well in that role. And and that's a really interesting、um, you know set of experiences for me. And also, I oftentimes refer back to those、uh, you know early engagements.、Um, You know, with key players in the industry now that were much much smaller than they are now,、uh, going to Shenzhen in you know ninety seven,、uh, you know, and its population was three hundred fifty thousand people,、uh, going to Taipei and having conversations with、um, Stan Shi, the founder of Acer, and you know the leadership teams at Compal and Quanta,、uh, you know, back when you know they were growing fast, but they weren't you know even a tenth the size that they are now. So it's it's the long view has been really interesting.、Um, When I left I2 Technologies, I've, I've worked in, you know, broadly, you know, a few startups, but then also some, you know, very large companies like Microsoft,、um, and it's generally all been around, you know, business applications,、uh, you know, innovation around the global supply chain, around procurement, and and now more recently around the design cycles and how do we use intelligence、uh, to drive greater, you know, improved decision support, oftentimes combining. You know, interesting insights around you know how the enterprise is performing with outside intelligence from the market and combining that together to to you know really transform、uh, you know new product introduction, for example, or you know strategic sourcing activities or the way that component suppliers are digitally engaging with their engineering communities. You know, that's really where the focus has been most recently at at Supply Frame.、Mm, fascinating. Okay, and with. Regard to your more recent experience at Supply Frame, then, how do you see this fitting in with today's 
importer, you know, somebody who perhaps is uh, an entrepreneur who's developing a new product? Right. Well, I think that um, what we're really focused on at Supply Frame is taking a very large network of um, media properties, community sites, vertical search engines that traditionally have all related to um, electronic uh, components and design, and then working with, you know, really key players in the value chains from, you know, semiconductor and component suppliers, large and small through distributors, uh, and then their contract manufacturing, larger contract manufacturing uh, partners down to the downstream, you know, OEMs, if you will, or, or leading mm -hmm. you know, global manufacturers and these different downstream industries that are increasingly becoming electrified in terms of automotive, industrial equipment, med tech, obviously enterprise, uh, you know, high tech and, and communications, all of those downstream industries, right, are, are kind of where we, we sit across that, that value chain. And what we're trying to do is, is, is derive um, new insights from literally billions of signals around demand, intent, supply, and risk. Uh, you know, across 600 million parts that we're looking at and we're engaging with 10 million engineers and supply chain professionals every month. So that creates a digital exhaust, which we can then see and understand, you know, insights that were clear before in new ways and then provide those insights in the context of, you know, for example, if you're a, a high tech startup and, and working through your first initial um, product design and you're relying on uh, you know, key suppliers, say in China, um, and other key partners in 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 that in that effort. Um, what we're really all about is providing new forms of intelligence to accelerate that product design, identify and de-risk key part component selections in the design phase, and then think about how to align for your ramp to volume, given the constraints and the risks that are in the overall value chain. And that's really what we're focused on. Hmm. And the, the word that you're using risk, I mean, this is something that really, really chimes in with a lot of the things that Renault and I have been talking about on the podcast. And indeed, Renault has been writing about on the website, on the various blogs that we've got and reducing risk, whether it's in a global electronic supply chain or any any kind of supply chain is probably now, you may agree, more important than ever, given the landscape that we find ourselves in over the last couple of years? We hope so. And what I mean by that is we've been talking about various forms of risk, you know, in, in different industries, particularly in high tech for a long time. But, you know, there's some institutionalized dynamics that I think are, we're finally seeing fundamentally shift, right? So if you look at, um, you know, this kind of over-focused on cost efficiency, you know, outside the balance of profitability, value, and risk or resiliency, um, you know, there's a shift that's happening where that shift is now towards resiliency in a balanced way and, and thinking about how to de-risk products at the design phase is, is now, there's an increasing focus around that. And, um, and that's true for large, very large companies with very large product portfolios down to you know, nimble, fast moving startups, you know, th those issues are, are relevant for everyone. Um, and we've also seen, obviously, with the pandemic, a, you know, kind of initial crisis testing of, of current ability to just simply adjust in react mode to the immediate changes that were occurring, whether that was, um, you know, manufacturing shutdowns, uh, you know, in key markets, um, particularly in China, then having a ripple effect, right, across, you know, other supply chains, essentially, um, a lot of unexpected uh, consequences, but you also saw demand uh, shift, right, you know, change in mix of demand, you know, we saw uh, demand for automobiles go way down, but we saw massive spikes in, um, you know, work from home tech and, mm. uh, you know, uh, fueling, uh, accelerating uh, digital services capacity at data centers, right, so all of that unfolded over a very, very short period of time. And whenever that happens, I think, you know, when we're in these crisis moments, it does help, uh, you know, folks to think more deeply about uh, how are they organized? You know, what did they just learn about going through this crisis? You know, how can they do it better next time? You know, how do they need to collaborate better across their ecosystem? What forms of intelligence are really useful when you're going through this, you know, set of changes? And, and, and that's generally, even though it's painful, 
you know, leaders come out of that, that cycle uh, being much stronger and, and sometimes with real competitive advantage against others because they've shifted the way they're doing things uh, to take uh, stock of what they've just learned. And uh, I do think we're going to see, I'm optimistic, I do think that we're going to see a new um, uh, set of positive changes, generally speaking, occur over the next two to three years in the next normal, so to speak. Mm, okay, the next normal. You've gone through a number of risks as you see them. I mean, are you able to give me a kind of more exhaustive list of some of the risks which have exhibited themselves? And you mentioned the pandemic specifically. Of course, everybody's kind of been touched by that. And and I, I would like you to uh, speak about, you know, the effects of coronavirus. But what else are you seeing in terms of risk that uh, that perhaps we can illuminate for the listener so they can right. consider avoiding these? Right. I mean, I think that, um, you know, you can look at risk um, very from multiple different dimensions, right? So what's unique about the pandemic is that it is a non-commercial risk to supply chains, meaning it's an externality that, you know, is really related to health um, and, you know, primarily, uh, you know, it has nothing to do with underlying macroeconomic, you know, conditions that were pre-existing per se or, um, you know, unforecastable, uh, you know, weather events, et cetera, that are sort of, you know, event-based um, or, you know, predictable and potentially avoidable risks that relate to things like supply lead times and constraints in the market, um, you know, that's complicated because it's multi-tier, but all these kind of, you know, uh, risk dimensions really came alive during the pandemic. But it's, I think it's really important that we don't lose sight of um, you know, a compounding, almost cascading set of risk, uh, you know, issues that were still, uh, you know, driving massive volatility in supply markets and in the high tech value chain or electronics value chain, even before the pandemic occurred. So we saw issues related to, you know, changing uh, tariff uh, agreements, retaliatory tariffs between the US and China, you know, bilateral tariff uh, tensions between Korea and Japan. Uh, you know, shifting uh, trade balance uh, between, you know, new trade agreements being formed, you know, transitioning down to TPP, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We could go on and on, right? But there's these geopolitical factors which are increasingly important to consider, you know, in addition to the normal cyclicality of capital intensive aspects of the electronics industry, such as fab production and capacity or the technology life cycle of, um, you know, memory and storage and, and you know, these specific dynamics that are, you know, you can, you can examine just within a sub-commodity group, um, you know, now we have to look at all these factors in combination, and that's what makes it very difficult. Hmm. As an importer of electronics, you've got this sort of nest of different factors that you need to be considering. You've also been hit by the coronavirus. What's the way out of this for let's say you, you're a business and you've been struggling with the different risks that have hit your supply chain and there the seems to be like you're still, you're still in this tunnel. Where's the light at the end of the tunnel? Well, I think it, it will take some time to, to play out. And obviously everyone's, you know, um, you know, specific situation will vary just based on the, you know, the nature of their markets that they're serving from a demand perspective, and then the nature of the, um, you know, the products that they're uh, designing and uh, manufacturing in terms of, uh, you know, what is critical to design, where are their key, you know, potential uh, risk areas from a, from a supply, um, you know, commodity group, and then, you know, the visibility and, and sort of resiliency that's being designed in uh, into the supply chain. So, you know, breaking that apart, you know, one of the, the key questions is uh, where you are in your go-to-market journey and where is the, um, you know, the, the, the best view of, of the shift in demand um, happening? Because there's a lot of, um, you know, potential pent-up demand, you know, as we get into, uh, you know, more improved conditions uh, mm -hmm. with limited restrictions on number of uh, aspects of, you know, getting back to normal, so to speak, um, with vaccines, that may have a, a significant uncertainty around your downstream demand, the timing for that or what the uplift might be. So in, in 
you know, it's, it's then important to think about how to optimize the supply chain with flexibility to maybe, you know, ramp fairly quickly to upside and minimize your downside risk. And that part of that really requires thinking through where are your, your opportunities for flexibility or risk sharing with your key partners. If that's a key contract manufacturer, you might want to re-explore your uh, you know, service level agreement and your, you know, liability sharing um, rules and, and, and sort of thinking around that in terms of inventory, uh, for example, or lead time. Um, and it, and, but it needs to go further, as we know, uh, there's a complex multi-tier uh, set of dynamics in the value chain. And we're seeing that right now play out around key components into the automotive OEM space. And, you know, it goes all the way back to foundries and fab capacity um, that's shared, you know, for fabulous semiconductor companies that use and rely on like say TSMC uh, and UMC as their key foundry partners. Um, you know, that's just one tiny example of, you know, this ripple effect. So it's really important to kind of think through the multi-tier supply chain and where your critical potential bottlenecks are or where you have, um, you know, potential risk, at, you know, at the supply base side. Um, and then I think it's, it's really about, you know, understanding where you can drive um, the biggest uh, long-term impact, what we have found is really at the point of design. So it's very hard to requalify parts and suppliers after you've transitioned from a design bill of material into a manufacturing bill of material, oftentimes maybe shared with a contract manufacturer. And what we found is that the ability to um, de-risk that bill of material design by qualifying in in the design phase, alternate parts and suppliers, for example, so that you are pre-qualified to make transitions while it's in manufacturing if needed, um, is one of the most important ways to de-risk products in this environment. So, um, you know, it depends on the product itself, but what we've generally found, you know, depending on a, uh, the product design is that 70 to 80% of the lifetime cost and risk of a product is designed in at the bill and material phase at the design, you know, new product introduction before release to manufacturing. And that's so from a leverage point perspective, we believe that that's really where you start your, your focus to, uh, to manage uncertainty right now. Wow. Excellent. Some really good, uh, really good advice coming in here. So really grateful for that. Thank you. Earlier on, you did mention the issues between China and the US at the moment. Of course, you're in America yourself. So I just wanted to ask you a little bit more about the US-China trade war, as, as it's uh, often known. I mean, is this a risk that you see being an ongoing issue, especially for, of course, American businesses and importers? It's interesting because I think in general, you know, one of the things that was very clear was that with the um, the last sort of recent history with retaliatory terrorists during the Trump administration and China, the biggest challenge was actually not the fact that the you know proposed tariff and the scope of you know products under the you know harmonized uh, uh, trade you know sort of codes would be you know HTS codes you know what what scope right was being impacted whether that was 5%, 10%, you know, uh, or even 25%, the biggest challenge was uncertainty because they were going back and forth. There was a lot of threats and then there was a compromise and, and you could see this play out over a year and a half. Mm -hmm. and, and what really kills supply chains is not uh, just so much specifically a change in tariffs. It is the uncertainty associated with the cost profile. And what that uncertainty led to was generally most large global manufacturers seeking to partially diversify outside of China, either final assembly locations and shifting to a regional or near shoring for final assembly. Mm -hmm. um, and then potentially uh, looking at, you know, tier one suppliers, uh, at least finding, you know, multiple uh, manufacturing uh, tier one supplier locations. So sources of supply were, were increasingly less single sourced, multi-sourced, and then also potentially multi-sourced out of China, just from a geography perspective. But if we looked at the total impact of the quote unquote transition out of China over the last two to three years, 
I mean, it's been less than five, less than 10% for, for, you know, on aggregate, right? So this notion that, uh, you know, decoupling could occur quickly is just, uh, you know, not reality, right? Mm. Even if there was, you know, ratcheting up of even more intense, um, you know, negotiations related to tariffs between China and the United States, what we would see is a combination of absorbing the cost, the increased cost of components into products, which would reduce the net margin for that manufacturer, for that brand company, and or passing those costs on to consumers. And we saw both really transpire without significant shifts in uh, demand for, for most uh, companies in their categories, right? It, there was a, there was a, a fair amount of um, elasticity, if you will, around absorbing both the cost and price changes. And I think we would see more of the same. I think um, the, the risk, you know, Deutsche Bank has an interesting study that, you know, fund almost that they're looking at, composite fund that's um, looking at the uh, um, tech cold war, right? And, and they look at the total cost of decoupling being, you know, over three and a half trillion dollars over a few years, right? If that's the total extreme, right, of what would happen. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, I, I just, regardless of the rhetoric and regardless of very reasonable um, opportunities for negotiation around, for example, improved IP protection uh, for manufacturer, external manufacturers looking to build and partner and create joint ventures within China, and then improve transparency, um, you know, and, and potentially, you know, different uh, improved regulations regarding uh, labor, uh, worker safety, um, you know, material composition, um, you know, et cetera. You know, all of those are the normal things that you look for ongoing negotiations in, in trade agreements. And we saw that with, you know, the former NAFTA agreement, you know, getting renegotiated in a similar way. The Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, also had the same scope of negotiating elements in there. So I think that what we're going to see is re-engagement, a re-looking at the same open issues that are there, probably less uncertainty than what we saw with the Trump administration, probably a little bit more visibility to a clear policy um, goal and structure. But I think the real-term risks uh, around, you know, unexpected, you know, sort of changes in tariffs is relatively low, um, particularly when you compare it to the other, you know, more interesting sort of, in, in my opinion, sort of dynamics that are going on um, that are not necessarily impacted directly by trade policy. Okay, and could you uh, elaborate on what some of those would be? Well, I think 2021, you know, is becoming almost a perfect storm year of, you know, we're coming out of COVID restrictions. We've got demand has dramatically shifted from, um, like I talked about earlier, just, you know, spiky growth, immediate in in consumer technology and in working from home and digital services, hyperscale computing demand mm -hmm. has really gone through the roof. And then we're seeing the um, industries that were directly impacted coming back online, like automotive, um, you know, downstream hospitality, et cetera, you know, just the general economic recovery. You have kind of a V-shaped recovery of demand. And all that's coming at a time where you've got, uh, you know, a capital kind of expenditure pattern going in where there's increasing capital expenditures within, you know, large foundry and fab, but real capacity limitations there. And you're seeing a shift in key component uh, commodity categories around a reallocation of demand, not even within among customers, but across industries. So a general shift, for example, of passives, uh, multi-layer ceramic capacitors that we saw constrained in 2018 you know, now being allocated into other industries that have higher reliability and profitability, moving, say, from consumer electronics into, say, automotive or med tech, right? And so you're seeing this kind of allocation shift and increasing lead times that then is impacting downstream industries and is not something that you can work your way out of very quickly. I mean, the, the issues that the automotive uh, OEMs are facing relate to some standard ICs that just simply got consumed by, um, you know, you know, other other industries, you know, and, and to, to a large degree, or they had ASICs or custom, uh, you know, uh, 
designs of, of chipsets that you know go into mobility systems and auto systems, et cetera, that now are severely constrained, you know, in terms of weeks because of the lead time constraints that they have. And this is impacting directly, um, you know, automobile uh, production schedules because that entire industry is built on a just-in-time, just-in-sequence model from a supply chain perspective at the final assembly point, mm -hmm. but then doesn't have very clear ways to buffer variability for long lead time or highly volatile demand upstream. They push that liability to their tier one suppliers and upstream. And, and you see this kind of playing out in different ways in different industry value chains, that there's a kind of a, a resetting of what is just in case versus just in time. What is the appropriate inventory buffer? How do I negotiate my agreements to provide greater flexibility and balance risk sharing versus just chasing lowest cost, you know, and, and at, all, at all times, right? For total landed costs like that. There's a, there's a shift at, in decision making that that's you know you see occurring um, across multiple value chains and will continue to play out through this year. But I think this year is more interesting from a constraint perspective than I've seen probably really since the 1999 2000 2001 B2B bubble burst cycle that we saw um, you know going back 20 years ago. Yeah, I, I think with everything that's gone on, there's definitely had to become quite a change in outlook for people who are importing. I mean, some companies were very hard hit when the pandemic first hit. I, I guess in many ways, perhaps they just weren't prepared to uh, and hadn't really looked at how to make their supply chain more resilient. Well, I, I, it was such an externality. Like I said, this is a non-commercial, you know, yeah. risk event, right? And so even the largest companies really have no business continuity planning around pandemic response. I mean, it might have even been in their insurance policies, but they certainly weren't operationally planning for that. Now that's that may change. But if you're a smaller, earlier stage or startup, you know, kind of, you know, targeting a very specific market and, and looking to scale and grow, I think the uh, the risks have been substantial and far exceeded anyone's ability to buffer, right? You know, that risk. So it's really more about aligning and trying to synchronize um, with recovery with the best view of what's driving demand um, and really look at doing everything you can to reconfirm your understanding of supply lead time, you know, flexibility around upside, where your key bottleneck constraints are. And then, like I said, maybe potentially going back to the design phase and doing a design review of those active bills of material to make them you know, kind of built in more resiliency and, and in that design itself and maybe going through a, a quick design review. I mean, those really are the tips to take away for businesses who are developing a new products in, uh, in 2021, aren't they? Absolutely. Richard, you mentioned design to source intelligent earlier on in the, uh, in the podcast. So could you tell me a little bit more about that, please? Yeah, you bet. I mean, we've really... When we were looking at um, all of the reach that we had from a you know network uh, perspective, whether that's you know looking at standard part parametric data and engineering content across 600 million parts, or you know the search activities of engineers and sourcing professionals, or how we can see new design cycles being developed globally. This year, what we realized we or last year in 2020, what we did is we we realize that it's really all about a new form of intelligence that we're able to aggregate and analyze. And we think that, you know, this design to source intelligence, is, which is really all about how do you, you know, look at multiple uh, information sources from these very large, you know, big data sources now that we have, you know, across either our network or that we can tap into, and then really distill down leading indicators of demand and, and engineering uh, activity and popularity of where we think the, the market's gonna be going. And then some very interesting triangulation around lagging indicators around supply lead times and what might be correlated with changes in capacity, changes in price and cost, um, you know, and where that trending is happening and combine that in, and push new forms of insight into both the design process uh, you know, as well as managing the operational supply chain over time. And I think this is, you know, we're excited about what we're doing here, but it's a, it's an 
interesting way of um, a pattern that, that we see happening across other industries. And it's really a, a mindset where you want to remain very curious and look outside in for new forms of insight that might influence your decisions, because typically the information you have, you know, based on your own experience, or your own enterprise systems is very limited and doesn't, you know, have the, the new information that you need to kind of, you know, be vibrant and adaptive uh, in this uh, new resiliency, right, that's required to be effective in the global electronics value chain. So, you know, one takeaway is just in general is folks to, um, you know, be very curious, look at new forms of information that, that you may have access to through your partners or through these, uh, these networks of information that are now becoming online. Mm. Yeah, wise words. That's uh, that's that's really great, and I'm so happy you're able to give that sort of tangible takeaway for the listeners uh, because this is what it's all about. This is why I wanted to, uh, you know, get you on and tap into that experience. So yeah, I've really enjoyed everything that you've had to share today, Richard. It's been brilliant. Thank you so much, Adrian, for the opportunity, um, and uh, continue the good work on sharing these insights uh, for particularly for importers and others that are looking to. Uh, constantly improve their business models around how they work uh, with key suppliers and partners in China. Yeah, well, we'll surely do that. But And for anybody that is listening and you want to hear a little bit more about Supply Frame, you can actually find Supply Frame at supplyframe.com. I will add the link to that to the show notes so everybody can go and have a look at that there. Excellent. All right, Richard, thank you so much for joining us and we'll speak to you soon. Thank you much have a great day bye-bye thanks for joining us if you've enjoyed today's podcast don't forget to like and share and you can subscribe on apple podcasts spotify and all other places that you get your podcasts from see you next time